guys, welcome to another episode of the Nihongo Master Podcast. I'm your host Azra and we've come to our final episode of this season. Hurrah! We looked at all things pop culture in season 8. Fashion, anime, manga, films, movies, TV. It's safe to say that Japanese popular culture has developed significantly in unexpected yet fascinating ways. We're wrapping up the season with a look at how Japanese popular culture created its unique pop culture identity and expanded itself globally. I mean, when you look at it, the beginnings of this contemporary pop culture was back in the shadow of the Second World War and the earlier China campaign. It must have taken a whole lot of being contested and challenged to get to where they are today. And just in a few decades, the land of the rising sun's global image has radically changed, especially in the West. Japan's story is a great example to show that pop culture is not only extremely potent in shaping national identity, but also the impact of using soft power to influence and attract international cooperation. So we'll briefly look at the evolution and post-war history of Japanese popular culture and Japan's export strategy of its modern contemporary culture internationally, which includes the campaign Cool Japan. What a perfect way to round up the end of the season, don't you think? And as usual, don't forget to have your notebooks and pen ready to jot down useful vocabulary words and even some fun facts. We all know that Japan's traditional rekishi history is rich and abundant, dating back to centuries old. Prior to World War II, what most knew of Japanese culture was its practices that include Zen Buddhism, calligraphy, and sumo. Yeah, anime and your J-pop idols weren't a thing during the Edo period. Surprise, surprise. While those traditions are still alive to this day, that's not what we're talking about here. Modern-day Japanese pop culture only came to be in the past few decades or so. See, Japanese popular culture started taking shape in the years after the war through products and media that began to shape a new image of Japan. Post-war Japan initially focused on its strong industrial sector to develop in technology, automobiles, and electronic goods, and afterwards, focused on spreading their cultural influence. See, the war, or senso in Japanese, didn't do so well for Japan. Its neighboring countries weren't too happy due to the traumatic historical past. And America and Europe still saw Japan as a military threat. I don't know if all of you are informed about what went down with Japan and the world during World War II. But I'm not going to get into that here. Time to brush up on your world history if nothing rings a bell for you guys. But anyway, Japan wanted a clean slate of sorts. Kind of hard after all that history. Popular culture was an ideal way to do that. So, to attempt to spread local popular culture and media, Japan had to create products that aren't appearing Japanese, yet not Western either. This desire to be distinct from other Asian countries and also from the West is based off a slogan created pre-war Japan, Wako Nyousai, to mean Japanese spirit, Western technologies. This is going to be a recurring theme in today's episode, so keep this one in mind, guys. During the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo, the country took it as an opportunity to show that they have distanced itself from the atrocities caused by Imperial Japan during the war and reintroduced themselves as a peaceful and prosperous nation to the world by showing a whole new image of themselves. One that's more economically and technologically advanced with this hip new popular culture that's not Japanese-y at all. This is just one method of export and advertising, which we will get into that in the later half of this episode. Safe to say though, the country did quite a bit of preparing during the years between the end of the war and the start of the Olympics, don't you think? Now, this popular culture, or taishubunka in Japanese, that they advertised for their new images, and I quote something I read somewhere, culturally odorless pop culture. I mean, I get it why it went how it did. It was a politically good move. It only made sense to want to improve the national image when, at the time, the national image was much in war and politics and all that not-so-fun stuff. So, to increase the acceptance and kyomi interest of Japanese culture outside of Japan, these culturally odorless pop culture looked a lot like kawaii. It all comes full circle, doesn't it? I told you in the first episode that kawaii is the common denominator in a lot of aspects of Japanese popular culture. The idea of hiding their Japanese-ness is, in quoting Koichi Iwabuchi's Recentering globalization, popular culture, and Japanese transnationalism to focus on the way in which cultural features of a country of origin and images or ideas of its national, in most cases stereotypes, way of life are associated positively with the product or consumption process. Whew, that was a mouthful. It's basically what we mentioned before. Wakon Yosai. 
Iwabuchi also emphasized that popular culture industries in Japan emphasized on hybridism and mukokuseki, something or someone lacking any nationality, but also implying the erasure of racial or ethnic characteristics or a context, which does not imprint a particular culture or country with these features. It's the idea that anything foreign can be domesticated into the familiar, which also blurs the boundaries of exclusive culture. Basically, what Japan did was appeal to foreign audiences to increase their interest in Japan and Japanese culture, all through pop culture products that may or may not be consciously linked to Japan. Take Pokemon, for example. It's one of the most popular Japanese animation in the world, and especially to kids in the States. The show subtly hints that the characters are not in the US, but nothing concrete that indicates them to the Japanese culture. So these products, regardless of what form of media it is, it always has one thing in common though. It had to be wildly creative. There was a strong focus on artistic and creative flexibility. Basically, anyone with a unique idea of how to express their ideas through the means of pop culture can be part of the pop culture industry. Now it all makes sense how Harajuku is a mix of a bit of everything. Because there's so much freedom of expression to create this modern contemporary culture, of course there wasn't a coherent style. Everyone expresses differently. But hey, the thing is, pop culture media and products alone wouldn't have been able to reach the state of where Japanese popular culture is today. It's the technology, technology, as we mentioned earlier. The economic growth led to the increased use of technology and allowed new media and popular culture to spread more efficiently. Demand was booming and technology was needed to keep up with the spread. Japanese companies promised products that would make life easier and they delivered. The extra free time allowed consumers in both Japan and abroad to invest more time into popular culture, kind of like escapism of the harsh realities of life. Japan made products start breaking into the US and other markets. Those products, along with other software culture products like animation and computer games, became more into the foreground. And after all of that, the association of made in Japan with cheap and low quality goods disappeared and instead now holds superiority in quality. So, the takeaway we have here is that the main key to Japan's success in its pop culture is by creating appealing products that are culturally odorless and using technological advancements to market them. End of story. Here's a quick vocab recap. Rekishi, history. Senso, war. Wako nyousai, the need to be distinct from other Asian countries and also the West. Taishu bunka. Popular culture. Kyomi. Interest. Mukokuseki. Something or someone lacking any nationality. Teknologi. Technology. By the way, if you haven't checked out our official website yet, why not give it a browse? At Nihongo Master, we offer efficient Japanese lessons that are quick, easy, and fun for Japanese language learners of all levels from beginners to advanced. Our smart tools will assist you in areas where you need a little bit of a push and congratulate you on the ones you've aced. With a community of over 50,000 Japanese students, you're not alone on your learning journey. Make new friends and improve together with our point system, collecting points as you go along. Ask away any questions you have on our group discussion pages. There's sure to be others as well as our Japanese instructors that are quick to answer. You can also take Nihongo Master with you on the go and learn Japanese as you trot the globe. Practical, right? Now that we talked about how Japanese pop culture came to be all kawaii and stuff, let's look at how it got to the rest of the world, other than through the Olympics. Japanese pop culture exports helped significantly in not only improving Japan's image after the war, which we've discussed in the first part of this episode, but pop culture is also used to improve economic profits, increase impact on the world, and develop the country's soft power. At the start of it all, during the post-war period, the overseas cultural promotion was done by Japan Foundation, established in June 1972. One of the many goals of Japan's export of pop culture was to develop a new brand for the country, as we mentioned earlier about Japan creating a new image for itself. A campaign, in Japanese it's campaign, called Japan's Branding Strategy, is a state-sponsored campaign to advance the branding of Japanese products in tandem with broader policy initiatives designed to upgrade the country's image overseas. 
It reflects the brand consciousness of nation-building efforts that are primarily concerned with projecting the image of the nation to a global audience. Now, I quoted all of that. So, if it sounded too formal, that's because it is. Japan's economic and culture boom happened during the 1980s, when its pop culture gained popularity in Asia. Its success became a model for other Asian countries who want to achieve the same level of success too. Iwabuchi explains that Japanese nationalists easily translate the spread of Japanese popular culture to other parts of Asia into Asia yearning for Japan. This view displays the belief that Asian people are now yearning for Japanese audience, technology, and popular culture the same way Japanese people in the post-war era yearned for the American way of life. Then, in the 1990s, the economy fell into severe recession, suffering a major loss of what is so-called the lost decade. Or, Oshinawareta Junen. But guess what? Pop culture sales and exports remained strong. Of course, when the government noticed this, it decided to actively promote and produce more popular culture to boost the country's economic growth again. Dial up the soft power. In 2011, the METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, launched a Cool Japan division which their job is to supervise the internationalism of the Cool Japan campaign and assist small to mid-sized Japan cultural-related firms to pursue a global strategy. Now, this Cool Japan campaign was inspired by the British Cool Britannia, and the key is to promote Japanese fashion, food, anime and tourism to a handful of countries, including the US, Singapore, Brazil, France, Korea and China, through creative marketing means. The government hopes for the pop culture industries to help with the country's economy recovery from the lost decade and the 311 earthquake. Quoting apart from Taku Tamaki's Repackaging National Identity, Cool Japan and the Resilience of Japanese Identity Narratives, the proposal of Cool Japan suggested that Japan has an inherent value, kachi, that can be distilled down to core cultural attributes such as spirituality, seishinsei, agreeability, Kyokan ryoku, acceptability, juyo ryoku, and sustainability. It also claimed that Japan is a mountain of treasures, takara no yama, that contained pop culture, food, design, architecture, and contemporary art, along with traditional arts, including regional specialities. Now, cool is subjective. What I perceive as cool can be someone else's lame. Did it matter when it comes to this campaign? For the Japanese government's purposes, it doesn't matter. Cool Japan offered a catchy slogan, but that's about it. It's not completely clear what it actually entailed. I guess as long as it fosters a positive national brand. And to make it even more positive, Japanese anime characters were initially designed with lack of ethnic features, emphasizing the mukokuseki aspect of Japanese popular culture, which we talked about previously. Do you still remember what it means? Now, Japan feels like they're the bridge between the West and Asia. This idea was well advertised at this year's Olympic campaign too. And I quote, pledging that Tokyo would facilitate the Yugo to mean merging of Toyo and Seiyo, East and West. That's because the nation began to accept and incorporate aspects of Western culture into Japanese culture, which resulted in them being seen in a better light. Over time, Western culture became more ingrained in Japanese culture. And now, it's quite obvious there's a hybrid culture of Western and Japanese culture in Japan. I mean, omurice is a good example. It definitely didn't come from Japan fully. It's a combination of a Western omelette with your good old gohan. This is also one of the ways Japan successfully exported its popular culture, by localizing their products. When catering to the local markets, they garner international success. Who doesn't like something customized to their own familial aspects of our culture? Much like Japan historically incorporated Western culture while maintaining Japanese spirit, Japan sought to market its popular culture as both Japanese and Asian. However, according to Iwabuchi himself, Japan also sees itself as superior to other Asian nations because of this acceptance of Western culture. What do you guys think? Hmm, to each their own. We're all here to discuss peacefully. And those are just a few methods of exporting Japanese popular culture. The global expansion of Japan's cultural media products soared in the second half of the 1990s and has remained strong ever since. In fact, in 2018, 
Japan had the third largest sales of media culture in the world, behind the United States and China. Mad when you think about it. Now, before we wrap it up, how about a quick vocab recap? Campaign. Campaign. Oshinawareta. Lost. Junin. Ten years. Kachi. Value. Yugo. Merging. Toyo. East. Seiyo. West. That Japan has successfully exported its popular culture to the world? The land of the rising sun has taken painstaking measures to create, improve, and share their modern contemporary popular culture. And by the looks of how popular anime and J fashion is, they've done it well. While this Japanese popular culture boom has had a positive impact on the country's image and identity, it focuses on the superficial aspects rather than the old traditions. Some describe this as Mieru Nihon to Mienai Nihon the Japan that is able to be seen in the invisible Japan. As Japanese popular culture becomes bigger, the invisible Japan, like indigenous groups of Japan and the like, become more and more difficult to find. What do you guys think of this? Tell us your thoughts by commenting on our social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you're keen to know more about these indigenous groups, we talked quite in depth about some of them, like the Ainu and Ryuku in Season 1, Episode 5, Island Life. Over at our Nihongo Master blog, we have tons of topics like these for you to read up on if you're interested. And of course, if you're keen on picking up some more Japanese for yourself, pop onto our official website, nihongomaster.com, to learn more. While you're at it, why not get yourself a subscription? Get a head start on your Nihongo journey with Nihongo Master. And thank you so much for listening in to the final episode of Season 8. Join me in the next season, where I'll be walking you down another avenue of Japan's rich culture. Mata ne! Mata ne!